Kentucky Jr. and Councilman David Marks. I'm Pete Chris Cumis, the Director for the County Executive's Office of Community Engagement. And in a moment, I will turn it over to Councilman Marks to give some brief remarks. The Councilman will then introduce our County Executive who will give a presentation on Baltimore County's 2021 budget. At the conclusion of the presentation, the County Executive will answer your budget related questions. There are a few things I'd like to run through with regards to the Q&A portion. First, I want to thank those who have submitted their questions in advance to the County Executive. He, one of his department heads, or the council member will answer as many of your budget-related questions as possible. For those who are watching through social media, you may submit your questions in the comment section. If we cannot answer your question tonight, we will have Amanda Carr, the Deputy Director of the Office of Community Engagement, who is also your District 5 representative, follow up with you. With that, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Councilman David Marks. Well, thank you very much, Pete, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank the County Executive for sponsoring this town hall meeting. Even when we may disagree on policy, we have always had a cordial relationship. That is important, but often missing in politics today. Much of our work since the last town hall meeting is focused on addressing the challenges of the pandemic. I would like to acknowledge the hard work of our Department of Health, our first responders, those in the medical community, and the county employees and volunteers who are assisting vulnerable families. The Fifth District is one of the most diverse and dynamic in Baltimore County. Our district stretches from Charles Street on the west to the Harford County line on the east, encompassing Towson, part of Lock Raven Village, Kearney, Perry Hall, White Marsh, Fullerton, and Kingsville. Many of the suggestions from the town hall meetings the county executive and I have held have been implemented despite the challenges of the pandemic. Let me talk about five common themes we have heard over the past two years. First, public safety. The county executive proposed robust funding for our police department, which the council supported, as well as capital improvements that will enhance the Perry Hall and Fullerton fire stations. Second, school overcrowding. The past two years have included funding for a new elementary school off Rossville Boulevard and a new middle school on King Avenue. This month, the Maryland General Assembly reactivated the Built to Learn Act, which will provide the missing state funding to complete these schools. Additionally, the county is finalizing a long-term high school construction plan to address needs from Towson to Perry Hall. Third, transportation. One of my very first asks from the county executive was to resurface Joppa Road from Aglet to, to Bel Air Road in Perry Hall, and that is done to his credit. Other major routes have been also also been resurfaced, including roads in the Kearney and Parkville areas that were neglected for many years. I'm pleased with the new traffic calming along routes like Hickory Harris Drive and Perry Hall, as well as the implementation of the Towson Circulator to improve mobility in our county seat. Fourth, open space. Baltimore County is close to acquiring two new sites in Perry Hall and Towson, which will be the ninth and 10th new parks in our district since 2010. The finishing touches are being put on Towson's Rata Ball Park, and we are close to finalizing a land swap in Kingsville that will create an unbroken chain of open space in one of our most charming communities. And fifth, senior citizens. More than 25% of our county population is senior. I would like to thank the county executive for funding long-awaited improvements at our Seven Oaks Senior Center. And again, I'd like to thank our volunteers and staff distributing vaccines to this most vulnerable population. With that, I would again like to thank the administration, and I look forward to hearing everyone's comments and questions. Mr. County Executive, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you, Councilman, and good evening to everyone for joining us. It's a pleasure to have all of you here, uh, even if just virtually. It is an honor to be here with you, Councilman Marks. Thank you for being a great partner on the County Council. And uh, we pride ourselves on the relationships we've cultivated between the council and the executive branch. And I wanna thank the councilman for being an important part of helping us foster that culture here in Baltimore County. Uh, we're also joined tonight by many of the, the uh, department directors in Baltimore County. If the directors aren't here, they're represented by their deputy director and uh, thrilled to be working alongside the councilman, our departments and all of you towards a better Baltimore County. Because over the last two years with the council's help and with your help, we have set new standards for local government. We've set a new and better way of doing things here in Baltimore County. And uh, I'm excited about where we've come and where we're going. 
So last year we convened with a town hall series that began under a very different set of circumstances. Working with the councilman and with you, we had closed an $81 million deficit. We had put the county's fiscal house in order. We had maintained our AAA bond ratings and we were on a much stronger financial footing, positioned for significant progress. We had also enacted unprecedented ethics and accountability reforms, continued releasing public data dashboards, and we were bringing new levels of transparency to county government. We were also set to build upon our record funding for schools, along with investments in our community. But abruptly, the COVID-19 pandemic upended our entire way of life. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we were forced to work with our colleagues in the county council to cut $100 million in spending, given the uncertainty of the year ahead last year. So last year, we passed a budget that was focused on the essentials, education, public safety, and the critical services our residents depend upon. We also began preparing for this unprecedented crisis, the likes of which we have never seen before. In March of 2020, we received our first case of COVID. Now we have over 50,000 confirmed cases. We've unfortunately lost over 1,200 of our neighbors and loved ones. And countless residents have had to turn to UI, almost 250,000 people, and many others have lost businesses that they've created. Within weeks, we were able to build a COVID-19 testing operation and have now, to date, given over 440,000 tests, tests that are free and do not require a doctor's note. We've given away millions of pieces of PPE uh, equipment through our distribution methods, and we created a robust tr contact tracing operations. We've also seen and have stepped up to meet the immense needs from our communities because I believe local government has an obligation to help people meet those basic needs. That's why we're proud to have distributed over 13 million meals in collaboration with the Baltimore County School System as well as our library. We've also engaged in partnerships with the Maryland Food Bank, local businesses like H&S Bakery, and our local Baltimore County farmers. We've also done over $10 million towards eviction prevention, helping 900 households stay in place. We were the first jurisdiction in the state of Maryland to use our local CARES dollars for this effort. And we hope that there's an additional round coming soon with new federal stimulus. Um, correction, that there is an additional round coming soon with new federal stimulus dollars. Uh, we're also proud of how we're closing the digital divide. We're, we've provided six months of Comcast Internet Essentials to 11,000 of our households. We've created a program for low-income families pay for childcare, supporting those who have school-aged children engaged in remote learning. And we also created a similar program for county employees who also have school-aged children. We're doing all we can to help our neighbors, residents and businesses alike, get to the other side of this crisis. It's why we provided millions of dollars to restaurants and businesses to stay open and millions more to keep staff and customers alike safe. We've given out over 1,350 grants across six programs totaling $21 million in business support. Over 10 million of that have gone directly to our restaurants. And through our small business grant program, we've helped nearly 300 businesses install equipment to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We've also distributed over 4 million as part of our small business relief grant program. We're proud that over 50% of all of our grants have gone to minority and women-owned firms. And this grant volume is about 20 times our usual workload, which we've been able to process quickly and efficiently without any additional staff resources. So I thank the Department of Economic and Workforce Development and all who've helped them do that uh, on that feat. And now with the arrival of a vaccine, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Our first vaccine was given on December 23rd to some first responders and healthcare workers. To date, over 113,000 county residents have been vaccinated, including over 38,000 by our health department. Over 62,000 residents are now fully vaccinated, having received both doses. We've, we've administered over 25,000 of those. And I'm proud to report to you that Baltimore County has consistently been a leader in the state for the number of residents vaccinated and in our efficiency of the vaccination process. But we can do so much more, and we know that there are many others still seeking a vaccine. But we ask for your patience because we continually receive a very limited number of doses. So in the meantime, let's keep doing all that we can to stop the spread of COVID-19 and save lives. Wear your masks and practice social distancing. 
Even amid the response to COVID-19, we've also continued our day-to-day -day work to continue driving improvement in our communities, taking significant actions to reform Baltimore County government and move our county forward. And I'm proud of what we've accomplished together with Councilman Marks and others and all of you along these past two years. In the fifth district, the councilman covered many of the projects uh, and successes. Uh, but want you to know that we have dedicated over $100 million towards improving our schools in the fifth district, including the 49 million to construct Honeygo Elementary School, 43 million for an addition at Pine Grove Middle, and initial planning funds for Towson High, in addition to millions more for maintenance and repairs at schools across the district. Meanwhile, we continue to explore plans for a brand new Northeast High School as we work with BCPS to finally develop a long-term school construction plan. And moving forward, we'll continue to do all that we can to best meet the needs of every single student in every community across Baltimore County. Of course, protecting our green space and open space remains a top priority. So we'll continue doing all that we can to ensure access there. That's why we've budgeted over $3 million of improvements to improve recreation and parks facilities in District 5. That includes the $424,000 for Radaball Park, which will be completed this spring, $2 million, of improvements for improve, $2 million for improvements at Cromwell Valley Park, which is currently in its design phase and will include an expanded parking lot, a barnatorium renovation, and a new trail. We're also installing new turf fields at Honeygo and Meadowwood Regional Parks, and we fixed the bridge at Mount Vista Park. Moving forward, we're continuing to plan for a new park in the Northeast area, and we're proud to have budgeted a record $35 million for recreation and parks across Baltimore County in our most recent capital budget request bond referendum. We're also making investments to support our seniors. We're in the design phase to, of a project to add 40 parking spots at the Seven Oaks Senior Center, and we've renovated the interior of the Bicota Senior Center. We also have an obligation to maintain our infrastructure and provide those critical services to our residents. That's why we've budgeted hundreds of millions of dollars to improve our water and sewer infrastructure, as well as to keep our roads and bridges safe for drivers and pedestrians. And we know that improving transportation is more than about roads. So we are excited, as the councilman said, to be launching the Towson Circulator this fall. And we're proud to say that it will be free for all riders. We look forward to seeing that project succeed in particular, and we're hopeful that we can replicate it in communities across Baltimore County. Needless to say, we remain committed to innovating and do we, doing all that we can to ensure that your communities continue to thrive. Thank you for your partnership in this process. In our first two years, we've also provided back-to-back -back years of record funding for public education, including over $240 million towards shovel-ready school construction projects. Coupled with state funding, this will allow us to complete the county schools for the future program and begin to address our other long-term needs. That's why we support it and are so glad to see the General Assembly has overridden the governor's veto of the blueprint for Maryland's future, which is now also unlocking $462 million for school construction under the Built to Learn Act. The blueprint will help us raise teachers' pay, make key investments inside the classroom, and ensure that our children have the resources that they need to be successful. As we continue to strengthen our schools, we continue to work with BCPS and a nationally recognized consultant, Canon Design, to develop a long-term plan to address our school construction needs. Throughout this process and in collaboration with all of you, we will form a long-term plan to ensure that every child, teacher, and family across Baltimore County has access to a world-class learning environment. As we invest in our educational system, we're also doing all that we can to keep our community safe. And I'm proud that Baltimore County remains a safe place to live, work, and raise a family. Violent crime rates declined over the past year and continued a years long trend downward. So I'm grateful to the work of Chief Hyatt and the men and women of the Baltimore County Police Department. Last year, we shared our update to the crime fighting strategy for Baltimore County. It included using enhanced data and analytics, increasing crime prevention efforts in our hot spots around the county and participating in the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. I'm very excited that we are starting to see the benefits of having put these measures into place. This past summer, we've also heard calls for justice and we answered that call becoming the first jurisdiction in the region to take a major step forward on police reform. With the Bipartisan Smart Policing Act, Baltimore County has banned chokeholds, 
required de-escalation and implicit bias training, and prevented officers with prior records of misconduct from serving in our department. We also codified many other reforms that were already underway. We also increased transparency with our police department, creating a data dashboard that tracks use of force by and complaints against law enforcement officers, and created the county's first ever policy requiring the release of body camera footage. Baltimore County is also taking the opioid epidemic head on as we continue to see the second highest number of opioid related deaths here in the state happen in Baltimore County. Now, fortunately, we have not seen the dramatic spikes other jurisdictions have seen during this pandemic, but we continue to lose our loved ones to addiction and one loss is one too many. So in our first year, we hired the county's first ever opioid strategy coordinator. We began developing a comprehensive plan to end this epidemic. We've implemented uh, the expansion of harm reduction services, including needle exchange and drug drop boxes. We've increased access to treatment with a new center in Owings Mills and another in the planning stages. And we're currently partnering with Shepard Pratt to develop a hub and spoke model for treatment in Baltimore County, focused on individuals with both mental health and addiction challenges. And we'll continue to look at all options to increase our access to treatment. Residents of the county also deserve a jurisdiction that will remain vibrant and livable for generations to come. That's why we're enacting sustainable practices to protect our planet and our home here in the county, instilling a culture of sustainability throughout county government. Over the last year, we started developing our first ever greenhouse gas inventory and countywide climate action plan. We started, again, our glass recycling program that was suspended back in 2013, and we're pursuing new innovations like the offsetting of an estimated 21 million kilowatt hours of electric usage at our Eastern Sanitary Landfill, where we're now converting methane gas to renewable energy. And we're committed to increasing funding for our recreation parks and our ag preservation. This capital budget, as I mentioned, includes a record $35 million in bonds for recreation and parks and $4 million, a doubling of our bond funding for ag preservation. We've also issued a new executive order requiring that any new county building to be built to lead standards. And we're partnering with BG&E to install electric vehicle charging stations on our properties. We'll continue doing all that we can to ensure we leave behind a more sustainable county for future generations. That commitment to sustainability must be reflected also in our approach to transportation. So we mentioned in Towson, we're preparing to launch the Towson Circulator, something we hope to replicate in communities across Baltimore County. In Middle River, we received our second transit-oriented development designation at the site of a former aircraft manufacturing plant, nearly 2 million square feet of redevelopment called Aviation Station. To reduce congestion, we're also exploring other ways to move forward and imagine new possibilities, issues like microtransit and dense transit-oriented development where it makes sense. Uh, transportation is an issue that the councilman has been particularly engaged with, and I thank him for his partnership there. We remain committed to maintaining our existing roadways and keeping our residents safe. So we will continue with record funding for road resurfacing and traffic calming projects alike. Improving our infrastructure is more than just transportation, however. It's also thinking about things like water and the policies governing our water system are a decade, are decades old, several decades old and in need of reform. That's why we're partnering with Baltimore City to conduct a comprehensive review and I look forward to working with Mayor Scott to, to modernize that critical service. Another area that we're taking action on is waste disposal. Trash going to our landfills has increased from 304 tons per day to over 1,400 tons per day. So in October, we convened a solid waste working group to develop a new five-year solid waste plan. And we issued a survey to gather input from residents about how to improve our trash and recycling services. We're committed to doing all that we can to keep our community sustainable and vibrant. And we're proud of the work we're doing to support our communities and our main streets. We are continuing to make upstream investments, whether it's strengthening our neighborhoods or supporting our young people in general. Uh, we were able to expand summer youth employment programs, even amid a pandemic. We went from 194 participants last year to 280 this year, a 44% increase. We look forward to growing this program further in the years ahead. We're planning the construction of two new PAL centers in Rosedale and Middle River, 
And across Baltimore County, we're making investments to revitalize our main streets. Towson, for example, was named a Main Street Maryland affiliate this year. Reisterstown has been named our county's second Main Street. And Catonsville, Music City, Maryland, has become our first ever arts and entertainment district. Over on the east side, Trade Point Atlantic continues to breathe new life into Sparrows Point as one of the biggest e-commerce hubs in the country. I'm also proud that our, our government is more open, transparent, and accountable than ever before. We enacted an unprecedented ethics package in partnership with the County Council, which included lobbying reform, a now successful charter amendment to establish public financing of local elections, and creating the county's first ever Inspector General. Last year, we took steps to heighten accountability and transparency, launching BCSTAT, our data-driven performance management system, data dashboards, an open checkbook, an expansion of our open budget platform that allows you to track our spending down to the contract level. We also worked with Councilman Marks and his colleagues to expand work sessions to later in the day. We created an office of community engagement where every district has a dedicated representative. And I wanna thank Amanda for being yours and doing such a great job. We created a 311 line. And last week we launched the county's first ever enterprise-wide operational efficiency audit. This is an opportunity to rethink government operations, improve our services, and find meaningful savings where we can. We'll continue doing all that we can to make Baltimore County more transparent and accountable, especially as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Speaking of recovery, our region must work together to pick up the pieces and rebuild after facing an unprecedented, unprecedented crisis like this. And as we rebuild, we have to address the disparities that have always been there. We can't just rebuild our economy. We must improve on what we had before. The recovery should be holistic, and we have to consider bold actions to strengthen our business community, support our residents, and address inequities in our communities. Because when we made hard decisions early on, we made a commitment that we would support businesses when the time came to reopen and rebuild. That means putting an emphasis on smaller and independent businesses on our main street. It means targeting resources to those who were hit hardest, like restaurants, movie theaters, and event venues. Because we know that some industries, like hospitality and tourism, have bore the brunt of the pandemic's economic impact. So we will think creatively about ways we can support them. For example, we'll be working with organizations like Visit Baltimore to develop a robust tourism strategy that helps to highlight our amazing homegrown assets right here in Baltimore County. But we're gonna put all options on the table leveraging loan guarantees, investing in main streets and business corridors, and expanding our small business resource center. Because recovery looks best when it's done in partnership and with an open dialogue. So we look forward to hearing from the business community and from you about what ideas you'd like us to explore. When this pandemic ends, we have to resolve to come back stronger with family supporting jobs. We wanna keep exploring the work that the Job Connector program is doing and build on the college promise to make college education at CCBC more accessible and free to more of our young people. And as we continue, to, we wanna make sure we're also helping our residents meet their basic needs with continued emphasis on eviction prevention and food distribution efforts. And again, within county government, we are embarking on that efficiency audit to help us prioritize our resources, sustain our recovery and invest in the things that matter most. So on April 1st, I'll introduce the fiscal year 22 budget to the county council. Councilman Marks uh, and his colleagues will have to approve it by May 31st. As you know, you all have a critical role to play in that process. So I look forward to hearing from you this evening about your priorities for our upcoming budget. Together, we can set our shared priorities, plan for our recovery, and ensure we are positioned to come out stronger than when we got to, than when we get to the other side of this. And with that, I will open the floor. Uh, there, are, we'll start with a few questions that have come through in advance, and then we'll turn things back over to Pete. Uh, to go over all the ways that you can provide us with feedback on your priorities for the years ahead. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Before we start with the questions, I again want to thank those who have submitted their questions in advance. The County Executive will again, as I stated earlier, answer as many questions as possible. Just a reminder for those watching this through social media, you can ask a question in the comment section and the County Executive will do his best to answer them live. If we cannot answer your question tonight, we will have Amanda Carr, your District 5 representative, follow up with you. Mr. County Executive, would you like me to begin, begin with your first question? Let's get right to it, Pete. 
The first question is from Carolyn from Idlewood, along with 20 other residents. A public open space question. We need money budgeted to wreck in parks that must include maintenance of park areas, and we need to fund open space where it is really needed and create it and create an open space COVID relief fund. Well, uh, pop popular question. Um, uh, got, got my note here. So, uh, Carolyn, thank you. And thanks to everyone else who's interested in open space and parks. It's something that Carolyn and I talk about a lot. Uh, probably one of the most common issues we discuss, particularly in the district. Uh, but I am proud that we have our team both working the existing uh, program open space uh, uh, law and the, the waiver. Uh, so we will be uh, working with the council soon to address that. Again, we had $35 million of record funding. Uh, and I believe we have someone from Reckon Parks who may want to also speak to um, the maintenance changes. I think Rosalind Johnson is doing a great job as our new director. Uh, we're thinking more creatively about um, not just finding more space, but also planning better to preserve it. Um, and uh, Roz, are you on or someone from Rec and Parks going to chime in before we turn things over to the council as well? Yes, Mr. County Executive. Thank you. I'd be happy to. Um, let me say that um, we have an unprecedented amount of funding um, that the county executive has dedicated to recreation and parks. Um, and I would venture to say that um, our county executive were very for fortunate in that he is um, an advocate, a huge advocate for recreation and parks, unprecedented advocate, I'll say. And talking to my team who's been here for dozens of years, um, this is more um, support and attention that we received in a long time. Um, in addition to that, the county executive has dedicated his time. We have been meeting with the county executive and a team um, to talk about program open space and expending un, um, unexpended funds um, for acquisitions, so much so that we've been meeting with the county executive every week. And the county executive has not delegated this to anyone. The county executive, the county administrative officer, and all of um, his team have been on um, these calls with us. So we have been pretty much removing barriers so that we can get these acquisitions um, completed. I'm happy to say that we have two acquisitions coming for District 5, um, thanks to the councilman's um, assistance as well. Um, this has certainly been a team effort, um, and we have more money than we've ever had expended to uh, these projects and these programs um, for the community. In addition to that, we are looking at maintenance. We have been in talks with property management, and they have been doing an amazing job with what they have. So we've been coordinating with them. We've been getting rid of some roadblocks. Um, we've had some challenges with some lawn mowing, um, and we've worked through those those challenges. They've been very receptive to our concerns, um, had done and have done nothing but troubleshoot. So the answer to that is we are on it. We hear you. The county executive, the council member, um, has heard you, and the proof is in the pudding. And you'll see some ribbon cuttings coming very soon. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to thank the county executive and uh, Rosalind Johnson and everyone who's involved um, with these efforts. You know, open space acquisition has been one of my top priorities uh, as a council member. Uh, we've had eight parks advanced in fifth district since 2010. Uh, five of those, um, sorry, I got to get this right. Four of those are in Perry Hall. One is along Lock Raven Boulevard corridor and three are in Towson. Um, we represent uh, the most densely populated and fastest growing of the fifth of the seven council districts. And we recognize that uh, people expect open space in their neighborhoods. Um, I'm particularly proud in the Towson area uh, where we have um, uh, funded Radaball Park, uh, where we worked with neighbor space uh, to create Adelaide Bentley Park in historic East Towson, and where we converted uh, the Patriot Plaza, the cement area into a new uh, green park. Um, and uh, we've also done a, a couple other things that I think were important. Um, when I came into office, we were uh, assessing no fees for open space uh, to a lot of the developments going on in downtown Towson. Um, and uh, we, we worked with the development community. And uh, we basically have said that if you are building in uh, downtown Towson, you will be assessed a $2,000 per unit fee. And that has helped us with a number of projects. Um, the other thing I, I do want to give the county executive a lot of credit on, and he touched on this, was 
uh, paying uh, using our program open space money. Uh, program open space is a fund that is financed through real estate transfer taxes. And that money was basically sitting unused for years. And working with this administration, we have started to spend down that money into important projects, uh, two of which we're gonna be able to announce very shortly. So thank you all for, uh, for your questions. It, there, it's a great question. And it is something where I think you're gonna see a lot of results uh, very soon. Thanks, Councilman. Not just a great question, but excited to see how many people, uh, 20 people in addition to Carolyn being interested in open space issues. So that's really great. Director Johnson loves that too, I think. <laughs> She's like, well, maybe that, maybe that record $35 million bond referendum wasn't enough, County Executive. <laughs> <laughs> The next question is um, from Meg um, from the Kearney community. It's uh, road repaving. To avoid 695 and 95, people drive through our neighborhoods constantly, which does damage to our roads. Some roads haven't been replaced in decades. How do we find out what the timetable is on resurfacing and when will it be? Thanks, Meg. Um, I do know that uh, the Bureau of Highways, I believe, has earmarked some roads for paving in Kearney this spring or summer as part of our plan ahead. Um, if you could let our outreach personnel know which streets need the most attention, we can certainly factor that into our planning. Um, the other thing I'd say is, in addition to uh, providing record funding for road resurfacing, was another thing we heard in our calls initially, which is why these are so helpful. Uh, we are also working with uh, Director Walker and the department, uh, Tony Russell, others in the Department of Public Works, try to try to start giving the communities a sense of uh, a timeline and an expected sort of horizon for road resurfacing projects and start making those lists more public. Um, sort of that's sort of another iteration of our transparency uh, and accountability work. So uh, Councilman has been a staunch uh, advocate for roads, making close second to the open space work we've done together, but uh, we, we uh, well, welcome the chance to know exactly where we should be thinking about prioritizing and uh, look forward to working with you. Councilman, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there. Yeah, sure. First of all, Meg, uh, I want to thank you for being a champion for the Kearney community. Uh, we, we've worked together for many years and um, I really appreciate your, your wonderful service. Um, you know, as I said, uh, my first ask of the county executive right after he was elected uh, was to get Joppa Road resurfaced where the water line project was finished. Um, and um, he did that, and I want to thank him for that. Um, you know, a lot of the, the roads that people see dug up, uh, particularly along Joppa Road, as you head towards Cedar Hill, uh, that's a water project. And, um, you know, you can't do very much until all those utilities are done, and then the county can come through and, and resurface them. I do want to say in the Kearney area in Parkville, um, we've had a significant number of roads resurfaced recently. Um, a lot of the roads that are south of the Kearney Parkville Library have been done, and also some of the routes uh, near Harford Hills Elementary School. And I think that's really important because um, I think too often the Kearney and Parkville neighborhoods have sometimes felt ignored. Uh, so it's important to make sure um, that, that we're paying attention to those routes, and we're very sensitive to those older neighborhoods that are so important in the northeastern part of the county. So Meg, again, thank you very much for your outstanding leadership. And I look forward to working with you in the future on these issues. Thank you. The next question comes from Rosemary. Can the county provide trash and recycling containers for its residents? Thank, thank you, Rosemary, for that question. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, We've just recently started a five uh, work group on all things solid waste. And I believe that is certainly one of the practices and things that that group can consider. Uh, we continue to look for uh, public input on that. So I, I suggest that uh, either if you wanna reach out to uh, Amanda, your district rep and or check our county website out. Uh, we also have a March 4th meeting for public comment uh, where you can register online to speak. Uh, the email to register for that March 4th meeting is just solid waste work group at baltimorecountymd.gov. Uh, we will register uh, I, what I, I guess I believe is your support for that here, but also feel free to do that with the work group. Um, I'll turn things over to the team, uh, either the administrative officer who's leading that work group and or uh, someone at DPW to, to, 
to talk about either that issue and or if you had anything to add on the question of uh, paving. Good evening, Mr. County Executive. I'd be happy to talk about the solid waste work group. Uh, actually, having uh, containers is one of the um, recommendations that we are looking at and, and working at. We've benchmarked with a number of uh, communities who have converted to having uh, containers provided uh, by the county. So that is definitely a part of our recommendation process. And Mr. CE, those recommendations uh, will be coming to you in short order. We have some interim recommendations and our larger report will be issued in April. But that certainly is one of our efforts. Um, the other side to that is expansion of our recycling efforts to reduce the amount of um, items that actually go into the trash and end up in our land landfill. We've learned so much through this process about the need to um, expand our recycling efforts as we uh, go forward into the future. And I will defer to uh, the colleagues from DPW regarding the paving. Thank you, Madam Mayo. Mr. C, it's DeAndrea and DPW. Um, in regards to the paving, as you mentioned, um, we will be we will be giving a recommendation to you in regards to certain roads in the Kearney area, but we are open, as you suggested, to uh, the community giving us suggestions that they think of particular streets or intersections that may need repaving, but we will be giving you a recommendation on that fairly soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Director Walker. The next question is from John from West Towson and Peter from Idlewood. Um, they submitted multiple road resurfacing and curb installment and storm drain, storm water management requests ahead of our town hall tonight. How can the community members or leaders submit road requests? The DPW show. Director Walker, I don't know if you or, or Tony want to as well. Thank you, sir. Again, we would recommend that uh, you reach out to your community liaison, Amanda, on this call. Give her the recommendations that you have in regards to uh, the particular streets that you would like to have repaid. I will say for the record that we do go out and we inspect the roads and we make recommendations on the roads that need to be repaved based on uh, data. So it depends on um, the, the condition of the road. But again, we have 2,700 miles of roads within Baltimore County. So we could possibly miss something. So I encourage you to reach out to Amanda and give your recommendation on roads. And we will line it up with uh, our data that we have for the recommendations for the county executive. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Peter, for those questions. The next question is from Susan from Towson, and this is a four-part question. Um, my husband and I are 65 and signed up for the county for the COVID vaccine. What is the status on the waiting list? Will we eventually get notified of an appointment to be vaccinated? About how much longer will it be before all 65-year-olds on the list get appointments? and how will the notices be sent to them? Yeah, thank, thanks Susan for that question. Uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, we are, uh, we're leading the state, uh, if not the country in terms of how well our operations are running, uh, particularly at the uh, state fairgrounds and Timonium, we can do up to a thousand vaccines an hour there. We get about four or 5,000 doses per week. Uh, just to give you a sense, we have a, a site in on the west side in Randallstown. We're about to open up another site on the east side of Baltimore County. We're exploring uh, things like mobile vaccination clinics and ways to get to our homebound. Uh, but part of the challenge um, is just getting the dose. Local government, we're the, at the end of the supply chain. And, uh, you know, a quarter of our population are seniors in Baltimore County. Uh, so when you think about the fact that we're home to almost 850,000 people, 
Uh, we have a lot of folks that we're trying to get through, uh, including those in the 1A category, over 75 health workers, first responders, et cetera. So uh, we are working through it. Uh, but to your particular question about how to get signed up, we do have uh, a registry. Uh, we uh, encourage everyone not only to sign up on ours because the, the state does not currently have a centralized uh, process. In addition to signing up with our health department, um, sign up with your health providers, look at the mass vaccination sites, check out pharmacies that are getting these doses. But in terms of what, what we can control, uh, we have been you know, described as among the best in the state. We've more people in Baltimore County have been vaccinated than anywhere else. Uh, we're, we're leading the way. So I don't know if Dr. Branch or Dell is on for HHS, get a little bit more color uh, flavor to the status and what we're working through on the vaccination front. Well, good evening, Mr. CE. Yeah, this is Della Leiser, Deputy Health Officer. Um, so it's a valid question. We get it nonstop all day. Baltimore County, um, as the CE said, has an incredible amount of senior citizens. We are currently still serving um, 75 and over. The county registry has over 2,000 individuals in that group alone. So I can't give a time frame. Um, we are only getting 5,000 doses a week. That is down from what we got about a month ago. Um, we do anticipate that that will change. And as we get more, we can ramp up and open up to more groups. But we're still focusing on that 1A and 1B group before we come down to 1C. Um, I do encourage everyone to be on the registry because that is how we pull names off. And when it is time, we send you an individual link to sign up for a clinic. But I have to reiterate, there are state sites and I would encourage anyone to sign up for those check with your hospital provider um, there are other sites that um, are offering vaccine at, at given times this is CE ma'am add one comment sure um, just to clarify one one statistic we have over 200,000 individuals age 65 and older here in the county we are the second oldest county um, on the East Coast. So the number of persons who have signed up on our registry, uh, Adela, I heard you say 2,000, but I think that's more like 200,000. Uh, yeah, 200,000, 20,000 are, are about over 85. Alone. Exactly. So it's a large number of individuals, but we're working diligently to get to everyone as quick as we can but there are other sites opening up and we encourage our residents to, uh, you know, seek the other sites that um, may be able to get get to you a little quicker. And what, one thing, if I can add, you know, once you get to the site, you will be amazed at the efficiency of the operation. I mean, it is like, it is a military operation. You will, you will be, it's very prompt and very fast moving. Um, and it's a real uh, credit to the, um, both the professionals and the volunteers who are helping with those operations. The next question is from Sal. He uh, states, lately in the news, we hear all about how the federal, state, and local governments are helping those facing challenges during the pandemic. The one group not mentioned in the era of public support is senior citizens. What is the county doing to support seniors in need during this challenging time? Sal, great question. I'm so glad that you asked it. Uh, it's, we are we actually continue both on the pandemic response and just everyday governing to do great things with and for our seniors. They are critical backbone of this county. Uh, they have given so much to us and we want to give back to them. And so I'm going to turn things over to Director Laura Riley to talk about some of the food distribution we're doing with seniors. Uh, the, the virtual programming. Uh, there was a recent new partnership going in and, and helping improve the homes of our seniors. So, uh, Director Riley, if you are on or a aging, if you want to just talk through uh, some of the great work we're doing to help support seniors both uh, through this pandemic and in general. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Mr. County Executive. Our mission to serve older adults, their families, and caregivers has been magnified. Um, infinitely during this COVID response. Obviously, older adults are the most vulnerable during this COVID. Um, our benefit assistance and information and referral continues. Our okay. phones are very busy every day of the week, and we are doing virtual appointments to help people uh, access their benefits. 
or to reapply. Um, we're doing all of that virtually and our staff have gotten very adept at doing that. Um, but Maryland Access Point still serves as the hub for, um, for all of the benefits through the Department of Aging. And it's also the food assistance line for uh, Baltimore County uh, residents of all ages. So we assist with helping people find food and scheduling deliveries for those who are homebound or under quarantine for active COVID. Um, we've also doubled the number of people who are receiving subsidized home delivered meals thanks to uh, additional federal funding. And we have a senior drive through food event every week. We serve about 650 senior households with heart healthy food. And those, um, those can be done through reservations right now by calling the department. So we also know that socialization is probably the hardest um, on most of our older adults. So we do have virtual programming happening with all of our senior centers. You can go online and do educational classes, fitness, language, arts, cooking, um, just about anything you can imagine. And for those who don't want to go online but have Comcast, they are now airing our exercise classes every morning at 8.30 as well. So you can uh, take an exercise class along with us. Our long-term care ombudsmen are very active and continue to advocate for residents of nursing homes and assisted living facilities. As you can imagine, there's much confusion. Uh, families have not been able to see their relatives. We are available to advocate for them through phone calls and virtual visits. And um, we are working very closely with the health department also and making sure that those who do not have family or friends to assist them, we help them with their uh, vaccine appointments. As you mentioned, we just stood up a new program uh, in the middle of a, of a pandemic, leave it to us to open a new program for home improvements for low income older adults. And that was a partnership with the Weinberg Foundation as well as four community nonprofits. So we're very busy on that. We've had over a um, hundred applicants and we continue to take those. So um, that's one way that we're trying to assist individuals during COVID. And we're also working with our partners to um, get technology equipment to seniors. We know not everyone is as tech savvy or has the access to equipment. So we are working with community partners to help get equipment into the hands of low income seniors and to also educate them on how to use it. So that's just a, a couple of the things we're doing, but our seniors do remain um, very much a focus for us. Senior centers do remain closed under an order of the governor and um, we do not have a, a date for those to reopen at this time. And I'll just add, uh, Director Riley and her team are also helping to the last question to register people for vaccines. If you know of someone who's a senior in particular or has access issues to the internet, um, you can also call 311 and our team will help get people registered on our registry for the vaccination um, registry as well. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. The next is from Laura, from who resides on Murdoch Road. She believes the budget priorities for Baltimore County should be the following. One, accessible broadband services for all county residents. Two, rent relief for county residents. Three, grants or loans for small business owners who have been affected by the pandemic. Four, grants for green spaces in District 5. Five, money for school building upgrades and maintenance in light of needed ventilation and physical space improvements needed because of the pandemic. And six, money to support our homeless population and those who may be struggling with food insecurity. Thank you for that feedback, Laura. That is very helpful. Um, I think we touched on a lot of those, but what I'll do is since it was your number one and we have not really touched on it, other than the internet essentials, uh, was uh, I'll let Rob O'Connor, Director O'Connor, uh, OIT, uh, speak a little bit to the work that we're doing together to expand broadband services throughout. You're on, Rob. Thank you, Mr. C. So we are addressing this from multiple angles as we know that we have a serviceability issue. We also have affordability issues and there's also a digital learning gap. Um, we have applied for a large uh, state grant to construct further build out in the northern region of Baltimore County, as well as in the past four months, we sponsored over 11,000 households that had affordability issues to connect them with high speed internet for distance learning, for telemedicine, and for working, uh, working remotely. Uh, we are working with the Department of Aging and also the Baltimore County Public Libraries 
to build out a plan to help educate um, the constituents throughout the county further on how to connect to the internet, utilize devices, and try and connect those individuals with lack of access to devices um, to areas where we could either do loaner device programs or other means. Thanks, Rob. The next is from Phyllis, who resides on Dover Road. She requested the county reinstate the rural legacy and agriculture, uh, excuse me, preservation programs in the capital budget at a rate of a minimum of 1%. Each year, there are increasing numbers of farm owners who wish to preserve the land for continued food production and to prevent soil erosion and water pollution from runoff. Thank, thank you, Phyllis. Uh, yeah, we want to and are, in fact, ratcheting up our support um, for rural legacy and ag preservation. Um, and uh, we, as I mentioned, have doubled our referenda amount uh, the past election cycle. We plan to do that, to double it yet again uh, in the 22 election cycle, referenda cycle. And uh, I hope the county will double it yet again um, in, in the year after that. So, um, I know that planning and our sustainability teams know that this is a priority. Uh, I know that the, the deputy director of planning is on. Uh, uh, Amy if Amy, you want to add anything or anything you'd add to that, but just that we are, in fact, taking this seriously and are proud of the preservation work we've done to date. Sure. I'm Amy Ante. I'm the, uh, the deputy director for department planning. Um, and Steve Lafferty is on as well. Oh, okay. Uh, but but yeah, but everything that you said, you know, that we're increasing it um, by a million every two years. And we're also working to increase our outreach um, to folks in the rural legacy, specifically along the, the coastal areas um, to kind of bring more farms into those programs. So that's definitely been a priority for our department. And I know Director Lafferty, uh, this has been personal to him, to both as a representative of part of District 5 and as our, our prior sustainability director. We will be working on closely together for time to come. Next up is Ariel from Upton Road. She is thankful that Baltimore County has taken action to prevent evictions and homelessness. The services were in high demand in 2020 and will be needed in the future. How will Baltimore County allocate funds for rental assistance and eviction prevention? And her second part to the question is, we all know why public health services and emergency preparedness are such important public services. How will you ensure that the county's public health infrastructure is able to respond to COVID-19 and future health threats? Uh, great questions, Ariel. I'm going to turn question one over to Terry Hickey, who is our a deputy director of DHHS, who's been dealing with um, issues of ev evictions and homelessness. And then question two, we'll let uh, Del Lister, our deputy director of health, Sure. Thank you, Mr. CE. So uh, I think as everyone knows, the eviction issues leading from the COVID pandemic are not are not short term. We're going to be dealing with those for months, if not years to come, particularly as courts begin to reopen this spring and we start to see more of these cases. And so the county has already allocated over eight million dollars to eviction prevention programs. We started back towards the beginning of the pandemic. We're currently operating a program where tenants can apply on their own. We just received uh, another allocation of almost $25 million from the federal government. We'll be putting that directly <coughs> into eviction prevention services to keep this going and adding features such as allowing landlords to apply on behalf of their tenants and allowing us to go back up to 12 months for folks that have fallen very far behind and, and are unable to catch up. So there'll be more announcements of that to come but we'll be continuing to spend this money over the next several months to make sure that we keep people in their homes. Um, and on to your second part of your question, Ariel, as far as public health funding, um, public health tends to be invisible. So our funding kind of disappears when things are going well. I think that's a national phenomenon. Um, we have been very fortunate in Baltimore County for several reasons. One is, we obviously have benefited from the CARES money, which has been um, carefully distributed within the county for services. But I have to say that Baltimore County works as a team 
Um, so public health is not dealing with this pandemic alone. We have the entire public health workforce, the administration, county administrative officer, elected officials behind us. Going forward, um, public health is always searching for grants. Um, our budget is two thirds grants. So we won't stop at that. And we have very innovative staff who will look at things. And one of the things that we're doing now is looking back over the past year, seeing what we've learned, what we can be more efficient at and what we need to um, procure and learn for future pandemics. So it's been an incredible learning curve in some respects, but um, we went through a lot of this 10 years ago with H1N1. We're gonna go through it again, unfortunately, at some point in the future. So we continue to learn. The funding streams are what they are. We have to be very creative with them and get the best bang for our buck and do it as a team approach. Um, and you know, we try to work um, smarter um, and do the best we can with what we have. I don't know that anybody in the budget wants to answer that question any further, but that's, that's what we're doing. And we continue to pursue funding to deal with the public health threats that come before us, whether it's a pandemic, an opioid epidemic or any other public health threat. The next question is from Thomas, who resides in Kingsville. He strongly supports the land swap between the MDTA-owned Rokowski property and the county-owned Schmidt property on Raphael Road in Kingsville for the construction of a maintenance facility. It's more Thank of a Thomas statement. For this. For the feedback, yeah, no, we that actually that's what I love about this, Pete is it's sort of combination question and and feedback in the budget. So, um, Thomas, thank you for the feedback. Roz, you want to just give an update for the timeline on that that decision and, and project, and we can we'll move on to the next question from there just briefly. Sure. Sure, I'd be happy to, Mr. County Executive. We are currently in negotiations um, with MDTA, um, and our goal is to get the best deal we can possibly get for the residents of Baltimore County. Um, the County Executive is always challenging us to spend other people's money, and so um, that's what we're trying to do. So we're in um, negotiations. We um, anticipate uh, we will. We actually just met about it earlier today, and we anticipate that um, we will have um, somewhat of a back and forth with the state um, in order to be able to get the best deal possible. But probably by the end of the summer, um, we should have everything worked out, if not sooner, um, and then we'll go through the appropriate processes of taking it to the council and getting appropriate approval from Program Open Space in the state. Yeah, and in fact, I could jump in, Tom. Thank you for your leadership in Kingsville. Um, and uh, I've been heavily involved in this process. Um, I do want to credit the county executive. Uh, this was a proposal that was uh, basically dead for probably six or seven years. And um, thanks to the negotiations that are now going on between the state and the county, I think we can have a, a very good resolution to the situation. Thank you. The next question is from West Towson, uh, Ted along with uh, five others have asked the same question. Why doesn't the county capital budget make far more money available for the acquisition and improvement of new land for pocket parks and trails and communities inside the Ertl like his? This is a priority that I have placed above many other issues, so I will only support leadership that supports public parks. I have also learned that there are problems with the county's open space law and that the law must be enforced so shortages are not made worse by development that are making open space shortages worse. Well, thank you, Ted. Uh, really appreciate the question and all your, all your leadership as well. Um, as we, we touched on, and I don't know if uh, Director Lafferty or if uh, I think Director Gutwald was also working on this too before, the, speak a little bit more detail about um, work that we're doing on the open space law uh, with neighbor space who's actually another great partner for helping us preserve land inside the Ertl. Um, we referenced the $35 million to sort of get our facilities back up to speed, but we certainly, if there are opportunities with open space and other projects, we welcome, you know, sending that to a man who will all support us uh, to be able to explore. Director um, Johnson, I don't know if you want to speak to the uh, parks and trails, and then uh, if either Director uh, Lafferty or and or Gutwald want to speak to the open space changes we're contemplating and working on currently. 
Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Um, yes, we love when leadership supports um, open spaces and parks, and we certainly do have that case. Um, we are in the process of doing two things that will help assist us with that. First, we um, are looking to do a countywide master plan. Um, our department um, has not had a master plan since 1950, which was a very good year, but things have changed considerably since 1950. Um, so we are going to do a countywide master plan that will look at all of our pocket parks, our neighborhood parks, our regional parks. We'll look at the population in the county and the amount of acres that we have and make um, give us essentially a roadmap moving forward for where we fall short, what we need to do over the next 10, 15 years. Um, so that will be very helpful. We're also in the process of geolocating all of our amenities. Um, we actually met with the Office of Information Technology earlier today. And so we will dispatch our staff to locations and we will actually determine the quality of all of our amenities in the parks, all of our parks. So we'll be able to look at it across the county in real time. And um, one of the things that the county executive um, always tasks us to do is to have an open and transparent process. And so you all will also be able to look um, across the county and see where the parks are and see where we have holes, see where we need to um, improve and acquire park land. So that's something that we're working on and we're looking at it holistically instead of a piecemeal kind of way, we will um, be able to have our goals clearly laid out and outlined in a roadmap for the future. Thank you. And, and I'll defer to Mr. Gutwald if he's on the call to sort of bring people up to speak. I'm, I'm not us. here. Okay. I'm here. Thank you, Mr. CE. Thank you, uh, Director Lafferty. Um, yeah, we, if, in terms of the open space fee waiver, uh, we, we established a work group. We put together uh, some heads to, to figure out to, to match up with, with the code and the fee schedule. So they're appropriate aligned. As you know, a couple of years ago, the council modified uh, the, the fee waiver based on tiers, try and bring more equity to those, those prices when they are being, uh, instead of providing the open space, they have that fee waiver. So we have, we're moving together forward, forward to the council with count, uh, resolution to ch modify that fee schedule to match it up with the tier designations. Um, and then following up subsequent to that, we are looking at some of the standards associated, associated with the uh, adequate public facilities and the open space standards to make that more of an assessment of what are the, what are the deficiencies versus the, the, you know occurring in each of those areas related to the impact of that development. Uh, so that'll be that'll be forthcoming and in the future to uh, evaluate that those uh, those laws and standards. In addition to this open space manual, that is there's a manual and a process in which uh, the developer has to provide the open space, and that is that is truly really overdue and uh, on the radar to get that updated to today's standards and and protocols and procedures. Thank you. And, and what, one thing, if I can add, um, uh, Ted, is uh, as a result of the um, approval of the 706 Washington project, uh, the developer will be contributing money uh, to improve the West Towson Trail that runs behind the Y. Uh, and the West Towson Neighborhood Association was very much involved in those discussions. Thank you. The next question comes from YouTube from Carolyn. Do you plan on raising county income taxes again this year? No. Um, I'm very proud of what we have done uh, in this county to uh, fix what was an inherited uh, deficit in year one. We did it uh, comprehensively. We did it bipartisanly. And it's how we're making these critical investments uh, in Baltimore County. We also have been very... Um, towards efficiency. Uh, I mentioned the efficiency audit that we just enacted recently with Public Works LLC, where any uh, operational savings can be diverted towards any any of these additional priorities that we're identifying. I'm very proud that in Baltimore County, I mentioned we cut $100 million uh, in advance and in, in anticipation of the challenges of COVID this year on the economic front. Uh, we work with the council to do that. And uh, in addition to those cuts, we actually very strategically uh, leveraged our federal CARES dollars so that we actually left this year with a small surplus over the prior year, uh, where other jurisdictions are not only struggling to do the kinds of uh, supports that we're giving, uh, whether it's food distribution. Or and I think we're well positioned for the year ahead uh, without the need to raise any revenue. 
Thank you. The next question uh, comes from Rebecca on Facebook. She is thrilled with the environmental sustainability improvements and says, thank you. Will the LED, will the LED requirement for new construction eventually be codified beyond an executive order? Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, we are really excited to have issued the executive order. Uh, it is a conversation I welcome uh, with uh, Councilman Marks and his colleagues um, to see if, if there's an appetite on the county council to, to make it uh, a county code goes above the, on the executive order. I know that the councilman has prioritized environmental protection and open space. So I would welcome the chance to have that conversation with the community, with him and with uh, his colleagues. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really good discussion we can have. Um, as you know, uh, Rebecca, executive orders uh, can come and go, uh, but laws uh, are, are more permanent. Um, and when you get that sort of certification, you may pay more at the beginning, uh, but it generates some efficiencies over the long term. So that's certainly uh, a discussion I think that would be welcome on the council. Next question from Facebook is from Jill. Sorry, I apologize. Can we ensure that develop, development slash developers abide by all open space requirements, not just place a bench somewhere, but pay the dollars required? It's a two-part question. The second part, what can be done to ensure new developers are not skipping out on the impact fees? Well, I would say on the, on the first part about the um, open space dollars is I think the work that Director Butler referencing in a prior question is going to be critical to ensuring that that happens um, and really sort of updating and modernizing that uh, work. And I don't know if he wants to chime in further, but I think that that's sort of where we're trying to move on the, the impact fees. I mean, Baltimore County did not have impact fees. It was part of that comprehensive solution that I mentioned in terms of addressing our challenge. Um, those fees should start coming online in the upcoming fiscal year um, as pr projects that were uh, no longer pre-submitted will be eligible for them. And so, um, you know, I, I can assure you and, and maybe direct, direct a couple of speak to this, we are you know, tracking and monitoring which projects as they come online would be eligible for them. Um, there are a, few, a couple of places where the, in, in the statute they ended up not applying, but if they do apply, I assure you, uh, we will be applying them to the, uh, you know, the projects as so I don't know if, if either of those questions, uh, Director Gutwald, you wanted to add anything? Um, sure, Mr. C. Thanks. Um, I would just reiterate, yeah, for the open space fees, I think this will clarify and solidify, um, you know, the dollar amounts associated with open space. As far as the impact fee, uh, we have put in a robust process for whether it's a surcharge or a fee, whether it's non-residential or residential, as of July 1st, that, 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 if you provided an, if, if an application came in after July 1st, we are notifying those individuals that this will be applicable. And then we're, we've got a process in place to whether it's a permit or whether it's at settlement, we have a process in place with OBF and, and the permitting processing uh, uh, staff to make sure that when that permit comes in, we're getting the fee associated with that impact uh, with that development. So we, we've got a pretty robust, extensive uh, process in place that's also using technology to flag them in the GIS system, geographic information systems, to notify uh, the person that is processing that application uh, to make sure that they're either in, you know, they, that it applies to them or they're exempt from the, uh, the uh, impact fee. So we're, we're working on it and we're making sure we're going to collect those fees. Yeah, if I could jump in here. So in 1997, I wrote my master's <clears throat> thesis on impact fees. Uh, so it's something that I've, I've been very interested in for many years. And, you know, as a Republican, I was always frustrated in Baltimore County that the costs for new development got shifted onto um, property owners, you know, the higher property taxes, wh whatever. And um, impact fees cause developers uh, or new homeowners to bear some of the costs uh, for the schools and transportation and other infrastructure that they are burdening. Um, there's no easy way to pay for things in local government, but I simply thought that impact fees were fairer than asking everyone else to bear the costs of those new projects. Um, the county executive and I both had proposals that would have charged developers earlier in the process. Um, unfortunately, the, the council did not adapt the, that exact recommendation, 
but the council did adopt an impact fee that, that has gone into effect. And so that will help us uh, pay for projects without having to increase your property taxes. And I think that's a really important point to make. Growth rarely pays for itself. Sometimes you have to have these fees to pay for important projects. Thanks, Councilman. Next question comes from Al on YouTube. Speed humps are needed on Avondale Road between 2nd Avenue and 5th Avenue. Police need to monitor and cite speeders. There have been several accidents in this area due to speed and driver error. Um, so on, on the first part, Al, thank you. Um, I will have Amanda work with you and get your information to, to work with the, the department on the speed humps. Um, I believe Chief Hyatt was having some technical issues, but if she's not on, uh, maybe one of the colonels, but Chief Hyatt, either you or anyone from B Baltimore County Public. I am on, sir. Are you able to hear me? Oh, very good. Okay, great. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for that information. Um, we will have our precinct traffic um, take, take a look at that location. And um, we have uh, multiple precinct captains that are on right now. So um, that's Precinct 9. Um, if you want to uh, give any information on that, you certainly can. Um, otherwise, uh, we can uh, connect with you at another time. Yeah, and if I could jump in here too, uh, we have a terrific uh, public works department that looks at traffic calming. Uh, a guy named Keith Link that heads that area. He's a wonderful working with communities. Some of these roads, uh, you, you really can't have traffic calming on because they're, they're higher ordered roads that just have a lot of traffic. Um, I will tell you that we've been able to get some improvements in the Glenside Park area, uh, along with the resurfacing of that entire community. So. Um, your community in the Parkville and Kearney area is, is very important to me and I know the county executive. And um, if that road qualifies, I, you know, I think it would be a good candidate to have those, those type of improvements. <clears throat> the next question is from Pat on YouTube. The Perry Hall area is needed of a middle school and an elementary school. How is the demand going to be met and how is the county going to meet the projects outlined in the MyPass? Thanks, Pat. Uh, appreciate the question. Uh, former educator here in the school in Baltimore County Public Schools, so it's, it's always been a passionate priority of mine. It's why school construction was our first and only priority the first year in the General Assembly. We're glad to finally have it across the line. I want to thank the councilmen and colleagues for their as well. Um, I think the Build to Learn Act will go a long way in preparing us to move forward. Uh, the My I Pass will give us a roadmap so that we know what we're doing in the next six, eight, ten years to keep the progress that's needed. We are committed to resolving the overcrowding issues in the Northeast, recognizing that uh, elementary, middle, and high may all be needed there. Um, we're, we, we have put forward uh, our bond referenda, I believe, was $200 million this year for school construction. Uh, I believe we are slated to do that again the next, uh, the next bond election, and we will continue to find ways to, whether it's the efficiency audit or uh, leveraging our uh, really outstanding bond rating capacity. To do that. The My I Pass Phase 2, which looks at the elementary and middle schools, it's ongoing. Um, so as the, the public input meetings on that work continues, I encourage you and anyone else interested in the schools to stay engaged and uh, help us, you know, solidify this plan and then uh, ensure that we have the resources to address them. Yeah, and, and if I could jump in here, yeah, we're very excited that the, uh, the new Nottingham uh, Park uh, Middle School, that, that's going to be moving forward, as well as the new elementary school over by Rossville Boulevard. Um, they will significantly help us with our overcrowding issues. Um, and the county portion of that funding has been in place for several years. We've really just been missing the state funding, uh, which was delayed for about two years. And now it is available thanks to the activation of the Build to Learn Act. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do from a land use perspective in the Northeast is we're trying to prioritize senior housing. Um, I have pushed very hard for any development at the Gerst Farm in Perry Hall. Uh, to be all senior. Uh, that way that development does not impact um, our already crowded schools. 
And we also have received some commitments for uh, development in um, the White Marsh Mall area that it will have a substantial senior housing component. That does two things. First of all, it lessens the overcrowding on our schools, but it also helps meet our needs for 25% um, of our county that is senior citizen. Yeah, it's a good point by the councilman, and thank you for that, that clarification, David, um, that the, the elementary school and middle school are part of the schools for the future. They're pre-funded. Okay. With, with uh, Built to Learn, they're going to be moving forward uh, relatively soon uh, to the extent we can address the high school capacity. If it ends up being a new high school, we'll have to find those resources. They're not cheap, but that's why we're putting forward record funding again for schools, doing the efficiency audit to find a way forward. So thank you. Yep. All right. The next question is from Ben, who resides in Parkville. He is writing to express support for Baltimore County and to include in its budget a feasibility study of the NCR to Jones Falls Connector Trail. This trail will connect the southern end of the NCR in Cockeysville to the nor northern end of the Jones Falls in Mount Washington and Baltimore City. If this 10-mile gap were to be filled, then people would be able to travel by bike all the way from the Inner Harbor up to York, Pennsylvania. This would be great for recreation and tourism in the region. Businesses along the trail would greatly benefit from extra foot and bike traffic. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm gonna ship this over directly to Director Johnson. And I think these are the kinds of things that we want feedback on because if we think about a master plan and a long-term plan for Rick and Park, these are the kinds of things we want to be thinking about. Absolutely, thank you so much for your input. We will certainly share that with the pedestrian and bike committee. Um, they meet very often. This is one of the high um, high priority areas that you mentioned. So we will certainly share that with them. Um, we will also be reaching out for our master plan and the community will be able to vote on their priorities as part of the master plan as well. But this is great information for us to include. We do know that we are um, trail negative in the county. So um, thank you for pointing this out and we will get started on it and we'll be able to follow up with you as well. Yeah, and, um, it, it's a terrific question, Ben. Uh, my very first bill on the county council created uh, the Baltimore County uh, Pedestrian Bicycle Advisory Committee. Um, and so I'm a very, uh, you know, big supporter of, of biking and trails in general. Um, I will just point out uh, a couple projects that are that are advancing in the 5th District. First, the Northeast Trail, uh, which will eventually extend from Linover Park to Barry Hall. Um, as a result of a, of a master plan we've developed with the community, uh, that that trail will be um, will be fleshed out over the next um, couple of years. Um, also, um, uh, we continue to work on the Six Bridge Trail in Towson and um, working with the county executive. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to identify uh, open space acquisitions that will allow that to move forward as well. Ben, it's a terrific question and thank you for bringing it up. Pete, you're muted. We can't hear you. I was going to say, Pete, is anything we're done? Or, uh... I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> I didn't want to, like, I'm sorry. Um, the next question is from Gerard from uh, Rogers Forge. He uh, resides in the 1800 townhouse community. I'm making sure I'm not muted. Um, and he has concerns with code enforcement, with rental registration, um, the livable code, trash, weeds, broken gutters, um, junk trash and debris. And he would like to know what Baltimore County is doing to make code enforcement more efficient to where they work closer with the community leaders and communities within Baltimore County. Well, thank you for that question. We actually, we, we love to, to bring together work groups and, and task forces to address these big challenges that are out there. We actually had uh, a countywide uh, work group Earlier this year, just finished up work on code enforcement. They brought forth recommendations that included many of the issues that you referenced. Um, and that's part, as we go through this budget process, that's being considered. Uh, Director Gutwald, I don't know if you want to add to that. We actually were talking about this very issue earlier today. Um, I recognize how important code enforcement is in the quality of life, and we look forward to addressing the staffing, the, the uh, communication, and the transparency issues you referenced. Yeah, I just would uh, echo those, Mr. C. Um, and you know, if, if there's a specific, if, if in his community, they, 
person, you can call the office, contact us or uh, your representative, Amanda, and let us know. And we will we will send people out and um, we can come out and identify what areas you want to us to take a look at for enforcement issues. But yes, we, you know, the trash debris, as we learned today, was one of the top uh, issues in the in the county that uh, we constantly get complaints about. So uh, that is, is well on our radar and we're looking at ways to uh, leverage um, other departments and other funding uh, in terms of even federal dollars to help us uh, increase our community and, you know, our um, code enforcement issues. So um, I would just offer that if you if you if you have a specific issue, you can feel free to contact the office or Amanda and we'll work with you. Thank you. We have a, uh, a statement from social media. Um, I am a county employee who pushes snow for Baltimore County and have been stopped a few times with people having their streets done. They would like to compliment Baltimore County on a job well done during the <clears throat> recent snowstorms, but there is nowhere to leave their remarks and would like to. Well, first of all, I wish I had your name so I could thank you directly, but uh, thank you and all of our hardworking men and women out there in uh, Baltimore County, because you are doing tremendous work. And our office is flooded with uh, a lot of really positive feedback for the storm response in Baltimore County. So uh, Director Walker, uh, Mr. Russell, your teams continue to do great work. Uh, we actually have a storm tracker that people can actually see the status of these snowplow routes, um, but we certainly can never give it away to do um, compliments, uh, maybe a compliments at Baltimore County MD.gov email or something. But uh, we we appreciate the the feedback. Thank you for all that you do, and uh, you know we're grateful for your service. And. This will be our last question, and the county executive will give his uh, final remarks. And this is from Tom on Facebook. With the passing of the Bill to Learn Act, Baltimore County has a unique opportunity to make a dent in its backlog of school renovation and rebuilding. Obviously, not all capital needs can be met at once, but how long will families realistically have to wait before we can expect to see construction on Towson, Delaney, and Lansdowne schools completed? Great question. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, what I can tell you is, as we discussed earlier, uh, the new elementary school and middle school were part of Schools for the Future, uh, which have been pre-funded. Uh, we have now authorized and encouraged the Board of Education to move with all haste. Uh, to develop all of the projects and, and move forward on all the projects that were uh, pre-funded, designed, and are effectively shovel-ready in schools for our future. Um, my hope and goal for my iPass, that whole process to create the timeline, the funding, the plans for all of our schools, including Delaney, Towson, and Lansdowne, um, to map that out and help us have a roadmap. So um, once that pro process is done, it is ongoing. We have ongoing community meetings about it. Phase two, including the elementary middle schools will be completed soon. Um, we are looking forward to that, giving us a, a more realistic timeline of what's possible. Uh, clearly built to learn has been a game changer. It will help us finish um, schools for our future. And I think it will help us accelerate our plans for my iPass, um, but we have work to be done and what we've learned through phase one so far is that there's uh well over a billion dollars of additional need just at our high schools that we haven't touched yet and uh whether it's the northeast high school southeast capacity needs and high school there delaney towson um, lansdowne there's a lot of needs out there but we're gonna education my number one issue uh teacher county executive parent and uh, we're gonna figure it out together with all of you Thank you, sir. Uh, just a reminder for everyone who is. Um... And, and Pete, before before you uh, before we wrap or before the reminders is um, is Jennifer on by any chance our director of educational partnerships? Just give her a chance to to say hello and as another resource for anything my iPass and school construction. I am Mr. County Executive 
Um, I'm Jennifer Lynch. I'm the Director of Educational Partnership, and I'm very glad to be joining the team. And we are excited about the MyIPASS process that is underway right now. We are in phase two. We will um, have more community forums and more opportunities for community input through surveys that will be coming up in the next several months. For people who are interested in more information about MyIPASS, they should go to the MyIPASS website to get more information, to view past meetings, to look at um, the recommendations from the phase one, and to provide input moving forward. Thanks, Dr. Lynch. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder for everyone who is watching on social media, um, if your question was not answered, we will have someone follow up with you, or you can reach out to Amanda Carr at D5 Outreach at BaltimoreCountyMD.gov. Mr. County Executive, the floor is yours. Thanks, Pete. And uh, thanks to all of you, most importantly, for joining tonight. It's been great to be here with uh, so many county leaders. We've got the best and brightest that we have to offer in our departmental leadership, uh, our Office of Community Engagement. And uh, I want to thank Councilman Marks for being such a, a great partner again tonight. And um, since serving together these past few years, I'm looking forward to reviewing your recommendations. Uh, those we were able to cover, those we've yet to, to get to, we will make sure you're all responded to. But uh, I'm really proud of the progress we've made together these past two years and excited about what the next two years have in store. The next step is this budget. Um, we're going to get through COVID. We're going to come out better and stronger together through this. Uh, in the meantime, wear your mask, keep social distancing, and get your vaccine when you can. But I'm, I'm honored by the opportunity to be county executive and grateful for the chance. So, uh, Councilman Marks, any parting remarks before we, we wrap tonight? Well, first of all, thank you to all of the, um, the county employees, the county leaders who participated tonight. Uh, you know, Baltimore County sets a standard for civility and generosity. Um, and um, we work together in county government, Republicans and Democrats, to try to address issues. We have spirited debates sometimes, but we try to treat each other respectfully, and we try to um, work together to advance the priorities of our constituents. That second part, generosity, has been demonstrated by the citizens of Baltimore County time and time again uh, since this pandemic began last March. Uh, I am absolutely moved by the generous spirit of our volunteers, whether they're helping uh, distribute food on the weekends or whether they are assisting um, in getting uh, COVID vaccinations delivered to our citizens. Uh, so uh, we continue to work for a more civil, more generous, better Baltimore County. It's been a pleasure to serve as your county councilman and to, to work with my colleagues and the county executive and his staff uh, to move us forward. So thank you very much. Thanks, Councilman. And again, thank you all. Um, if there are additional questions, we will make sure our Office of Community Engagement is in touch with you. Uh, Amanda, your District 5 rep will also be available for any issues moving forward. Uh, again, thank you all for tuning in tonight and stay safe, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.